Roman paganism can be really complex. Romanized Greek gods, deified dead emperors, unconquered sons, and a plethora of other minor deities make up the pantheon of pagan Rome. So, naturally, this utter confusion and surplus of gods has led to some rather strange traditions. So join me as we look at some of ancient Rome's most bizarre religious practices. Well, we're starting off with a bang. Apparently, ancient Rome really had a thing for birds. The Romans, in fact, chose an eagle as the representation of their powerful empire, and it was over a flock of migrating vultures that Romulus and Remus are said to have quarreled. In fact, Rome loved birds so much that there's a specific name for deriving prophecies from them, augury. And interestingly, Rome's love of birds also extends to chickens, so-called sacred chickens were raised by Roman augurs to predict the outcome of the future. It was typical for high-ranking Roman military commanders to consult the sacred chickens before a battle. Based on how vigorously the chickens ate their feed, or didn't eat their feed, as we shall see, the generals would supposedly know whether or not the auspices were in their favor. There's a pretty well-known story from the First Punic War about Appius Claudius Pulcher, a naval commander. A passage from Suetonius reads, Claudius Pulcher began a sea fight off Sicily, though the sacred chickens would not eat when he took the auspices, throwing them into the sea in defiance of the omen, and saying that they might drink since they would not eat. He was defeated. Yeah, the guy kind of deserved it, honestly. The Romans utilized another way of predicting the future, haruspicy. Haruspicy was the process of inspecting the entrails of an animal to link the divine and human worlds. This practice actually goes way back, I mean, further than Rome was even founded. Take a look at this. No, it's not what you think it is. These objects are, in fact, clay representations of animal livers, dating back to ancient Akkad in the 18th century. The liver was apparently the most important organ for a haruspex, but the lungs and heart were both focal points as well. An example of a prophecy would be, if a liver was smooth, shiny, and full, the coming days would be a fantastic time for sea travel. On the other hand, if a liver was small, shrunken, and crumpled, you might want to hold off on buying those Disney Cruise tickets. Our final stop on this Roman religious journey is the process of apotheosis, or divination. This was the process of essentially becoming a god, or other minor deity. Common subjects of apotheosis were deceased emperors. Though, not all emperors became deities, and not all deities were emperors. For example, both Augustus' wife, Livia, and Hadrian's young lover, Antinius, were integrated into the Roman pantheon. Though the divination I'm referring to is quite different than all of these cases. You see, the word apotheosis is close to the Greek word for pumpkin, Combine these two words and you get... I, I'm not even going to try to say that. When Emperor Claudius died in 54 AD, the renowned Stoic and poet Seneca the Younger wrote the satire on his death titled The Pumpkinification of the Divine Claudius. It's actually disputed who wrote the pumpkinification. Cassius Dio attributes it to Seneca, but some modern historians say otherwise. I'm just going to say Seneca wrote it because I'm a massive simp for Dio. Seneca certainly had the motivation to do so. Claudius had banished Seneca to the island of Corsica in 41 AD. He also probably wrote it in hopes of flattering the new emperor, Nero. Which, if you know anything about Nero, might not have been that bad of an idea. Alright, enough background. What's the satire actually about? Well, basically, it tells the story of Claudius' ascent to heaven, and whether or not he should be permitted to enter Olympus with the rest of the gods, or be sent to the underworld to toil away endlessly for all eternity. During the trial, all seems to be going well for Claudius, when, suddenly, Emperor Augustus, who at this point was a major deity, enters. He gives a heartfelt speech of all Claudius's shortcomings, like his gambling addiction, also his various infirmities, referring to his trademark stutter and limp. After Augustus speaks, the gods decide to condemn Claudius to a Sisyphusian fate. Forever he is to shake a cup with dice, but never shall the dice roll. So, kind of like Yahtzee, except tortured. So, actually exactly like Yahtzee. 
At the end of the play, Claudius' nephew and predecessor, Emperor Caligula, claims that Claudius is a former slave of his and takes him away. So, yeah. Deification was a pretty standard practice for emperors, but it seems like Claudius got the short end of the stick on this one. As you can see, the Roman religious tradition was pretty wild, and some aspects still puzzle historians to this day. I hope this video was historically enriching while also being entertaining to you all. And with that being said, I'll see you all next time. <sighs> My stomach. This pain. Dear me, I think I'm becoming a god.